Howdy. Welcome to the second to the last show of the year. We're going to have one more show, and then the studio closes between the, the uh, 24th and the 1st, so we'll only miss one Saturday. It'll be a rerun. Maybe in that time I'll make a creative entry for the show or, you know, music and stuff. Well, right now I'm just getting angrier and angrier. Uh, I'm getting older. Things were supposed to be getting better as I got older. Uh, I grew up with my family fighting for civil rights. We did marches. I, we lived back east. Uh, my mom took me to Woolworth's counters where we sat in to, uh, you know, make sure that they didn't get any profit if they weren't going to serve black people. That type of thing. And slowly we had progress. And, but progress is relative and it depends on who you are, what color your skin is, whether you think there's progress or not. And I was pretty isolated. I was one of those white guys that thought, you know, he understood. And of course, I got beat up a lot of times because I understood. Nobody wants to talk to a condescending little white boy that doesn't really understand anything. And I, I'm, you know, it took me years and years to understand. I, I, I'm an electronics engineer by heart. I didn't want to do politics. I don't like politics. I, you know, I, I approach this more as an amateur historian, and I say amateur because that gives me, that allows me to have big gaps in my memory and understanding. But I see more and more corruption, and I see people utilizing resources absolutely insanely. Uh, our representatives are supposed to be using our resources and, and the powers on our behalf for our benefit. And you just don't see that anymore. You see police being militarized. I personally believe that police should not be able to carry any weapons at all. None. Zero. Not even a club for the first encounter. That would make, that would make it really you know, necessary. The cops could hide behind stuff until they're sure that they're not going to get shot or something. Or, you know, talk. It. I, I'm sure you'd find more creative ways to talk people down. The little old lady in the Safeway store with the butter knife threatening to kill the cat doesn't need 42 rounds. If you give the cops military weapons, they're going to use them. You don't put tools in a toolbox and expect them to go unused. It just doesn't work that way. So you just have to decide what do you want out of your police. Do you want police to be militarized? Do you want to fear your police? Now white people are beginning to fear police just the way blacks have feared them for years. Maybe, maybe that'll change things, I don't know, you know. But if you don't get off your ass and get out there, organize with your neighbors, go to political meetings. If you don't take part in your city government, you're a fool. You're just going to let somebody else wash it away. You're going, you're going to let the corporate crap take everything. They don't give a damn about the future. They don't give a damn about you. All they want to do is collect your wealth. And it doesn't matter how much they have to destroy or how much tax money they have to spend to collect your wealth. And if you protest, that's fine too because it's a privatized prison system. We can use prison labor. It makes a lot of profit. Now, is that the type of system you want? Our representatives have done this, even though if, if you asked any person on the street, they wouldn't agree that it was necessary whatsoever. And yet, it happens. They're not stupid. They're doing it by plan. Wake up. Don't just keep voting for Democrats and then Republicans and ping pong back and forth. Or don't vote for them at all. They're the ones who got us where we are. If you vote for them again, you are causing the trouble. You are promoting the trouble. You are continuing the trouble. So if you vote for a Democrat or a Republican, don't ever complain about what happens to you or your money or your family or your freedom because you didn't care enough to do the right thing. If you vote for a Democrat or a Republican, you are a traitor to the United States. Do you understand what I'm saying? They do not work in our interests. Now, we've got so many videos. Just think about what I said. Now, here's a, here's a viewpoint by a man goes by the moniker Alien Scientist. He's really right on on a lot of things, and you need to listen to this. His, he has an idea about how to direct your protest. Don't 
burn down your neighborhood because the elites that you are angry at don't live in your neighborhood. So let's play that video and I'll be back in about five minutes, six minutes. Keep getting away with murder here in the modern American police state. And it's now blatantly obvious that buying more police body cameras will do absolutely nothing to fix the problem we have in this country since the courts have already proven that even when there is video evidence of police misconduct and murder recorded on video, that evidence is meaningless when grand juries refuse to indict the officers simply because they are cops. So body cameras really aren't going to make a lick of a difference because the problem is not the police. The problem is the courts. The grand juries filled with police-friendly prosecutors. The real power is in the courts, not the police. So if you want to go after killer cops and actually bring them to justice for their crimes, you need to be demonstrating and mobbing up courthouses, not Grand Central Station. Judges and DAs don't use public transportation. They drive Mercedes and BMWs, okay? They don't care if you block up the train station or traffic ways. Rioting also doesn't bother them. They actually celebrate when you riot, destroy property, and loot local businesses because some of you will be arrested, and that just means more business for the courts, more money, and more justification for the expansion of the police state. So stop doing that stuff. You'll never fix the problem until you understand and target the root source of that problem. That root source is the courts, not the police, not the train station, not the general public. Where do the police get all their power from? From the courts. This is very important. There's a lot of pissed off people out there demonstrating and directing their anger in all the wrong places. We have people like Tyrese Gibson going to the White House as if the executive branch of government should be telling the judicial branch of government what to do. The problem is we are following people who don't have a clue how the system works, let alone how to change it. It's our job to educate these people as to the root source of the problem and help them reformulate a winning strategy with tactics so effective that they will bring the system to its knees, literally. So get this, rather than mobbing up train stations and holding up all the wrong people from their daily affairs, what if we instead mobbed up all the courthouses? It's not illegal to enter a courthouse and attend court or even to stand around in the hallways. It's also not illegal to drive a line of cars continuously around the building to create traffic jams which blockade the judges' entrances in the back and prevent them from going to work. How quickly do you think the DA's office would bend and reopen a criminal indictment if we shut down all the courthouses in New York City for weeks on end, simply by mobbing them up and blocking people from going to or holding court? And yes, they can reopen an indictment. It's very easy, and it's not double jeopardy. Double jeopardy is only for trials. You cannot be tried twice for the same crime, but you can certainly be indicted and brought to trial. Mobbing up courthouses is not a crime. It's not obstruction of justice when we the people are protesting the courts for that exact charge. They are the ones obstructing justice by not prosecuting criminal cops for murder when there is documented video evidence of those crimes that would easily convict anyone who wasn't a cop. You want to see real change real fast? Don't block up train stations. Go straight to the source of the problem, the Staten Island Courthouse, and let those judges and DAs know that no justice will be served in the halls of their corrupt criminal courts until justice is properly served for Eric Garner, who was murdered on video in their district earlier this year. Indict those cops and let justice be served publicly in a court of law, not behind closed doors of the DA's office or grand jury full of police-friendly prosecutors. Until these halls of government known as courthouses agree to represent the will of we the people, from which all their power derives, then we the people will deny them the right to operate as centers of so-called justice. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Okay, so I guess th there's many viewpoints out there. Uh, I think that he made an awful lot of good points. We're going to have an awful lot of uh, information and more good points coming up here. Uh, as you probably are aware, now what, I'll back up. There's something going on in the background. Israel is attacking Syria in the meantime with all this other news, Ferguson and the, uh, the, the choke death and all that sort of stuff. 
masking out Israel doing war crimes, attacking a sovereign nation that didn't attack it. Uh, where did they learn that? Where have I heard that before? Oh yeah, they learned it from us. That's right. And oh yeah, Israel are the ones that conspired with our own government to uh, kill uh, Navy people aboard the USS Liberty so that you and I could be tricked into uh, approving the U.S.'s entry into a nuclear war in the Middle East starting with a nuke on Egypt. That was what was supposed to happen with the USS Liberty. Israel and the United States, I'm really, really proud of my country. If you don't recognize that as sarcasm or irony, well, we really have something to be proud of now. Remember, we got bad names because we talked about the tortures that we do, and other people would answer, America doesn't do that. You're a liar. You're a tinfoil hat conspiracy nut America hater. No, no, we love America. We've always loved America, or we love what America should be, what it stands for. And now we're vindicated. The torture report came out, and even though it was, you know, toned down an awful lot, it's, it's horrible. You know, I, I keep thinking of that scene with Charlton Heston from Planet of the Apes, where he's on the, the, the coast of the ocean, and uh, he comes across this thing buried over two-thirds in the sand. It's the Statue of Liberty. He realizes what that meant, the end of that civilization, his own home was wiped out and he starts swearing. That's the way I feel about it. Let's go to Abby Martin talking about the torture report and talking about Ferguson, so we'll be back. So the away. Senate torture report finally came out this week and predictably, the corporate media is feigning shock that the government institutionalized and codified a global torture program. It's also having a field day pretending like it cares about torture. Oh, I'm sorry, enhanced interrogation techniques. Oh, I'm sorry, EITs. So, 12 years later, obviously the debate is about how the perpetrator should be held accountable, right? Actually, in order not to appear biased against one of the greatest crimes a government can possibly commit, networks are making sure to provide more than enough time to the actual torture architects to tell their side of the story. We did exactly what needed to be done in order to catch those who were guilty on 9-11 and to prevent a further attack. And we were successful on both parts. This and report says it I, was not successful. The report's full of crap. In times in which you are threatened, in circumstances of that sort, the rules uh, can be uh, somewhat different uh, under American uh, constitutional law. We're dealing with animals. We're dealing with groups of people who behead, blow up, exterminate people. So we too people. should be animals? The way you defeat an animal, Carol, oftentimes is to act like one. I think uh, we were perfectly justified in doing it, and I'd do it again in a minute. I have absolutely no doubt that Darth Cheney would torture someone again in a heartbeat for no reason, considering the fact that zero actionable intelligence was gleaned from these horrific tactics. But facts aren't stopping the masterminds of the torture program from gallivanting around the MSM, explaining why torture worked. And Democrats are just trying to tarnish the GOP's wonderful reputation. And since when does torture have another side? This is 2014. Torture was banned internationally under the UN Convention Against Torture, signed by Reagan in 1984, under which Article 2 states, no exceptional circumstance whatsoever, whether a state of war or a threat of war, internal political instability, or any other public emergency may be invoked as a justification. It goes on to say under Article 3, that an order from a superior officer or public authority may not be invoked as a justification. Wow, Reagan was so ahead of his time. But according to torture rurs, it's not like they were pulling fingernails out of anything. Come on, guys, what's the harm in simulated drowning? Or tactics, which the report revealed encompassed everything from rectal feeding to rape threats. Come on, guys, they're just threats. And while threats of rape should never be downplayed, I can't help but wonder where the outrage was when we found out that prisoners at Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib were actually raped. One Gitmo prisoner claimed sexual abuse was rampant. 
at Abu Ghraib, well, there are even photos of rape. Yes, photos. Because apparently the sociopathic guards there wanted to look back and reminisce about torture at their 20-year reunion. Unfortunately, those photos, along with 2,000 others, are being withheld by the Obama cabinet. Gee, I wonder why. Another point that the media is rightfully honing in on is the fact that one prisoner in a dungeon-like torture facility dubbed Cobalt died from hypothermia on a cold, damp floor. But unfortunately, the amount of people that have died in CIA custody post 9-11 is innumerable. Glenn Greenwald pointed out back in 2009 that the interrogation and detention regime implemented by the U.S. resulted in the deaths of over 100 detainees in U.S. custody at least. Look, anyone who's been paying attention knows that this small summary doesn't tell us a sliver of the dark and disturbing truth. This report has turned into a partisan blame game and is nothing more than a whitewashed, sanitized version of reality. It's good that people are paying attention to this issue again. But the war criminals that ordered and executed the torture until they're standing on the trial at The Hague, spare me the faux outrage. Right on, the faux outrage. Just like the faux news channel. You know, they, they always misspell F-A-U-X. They always spell it F-O-X. I don't know why. Well, anyway, you notice... She talked about Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo. The torture report doesn't include what's going on there. It's, it's just insane. Now we're going to hear Michael Ratner, who has uh, been on this show before. Uh, he probably doesn't know it. I have permission to use his videos, but anyway, he doesn't know me from Adam. But I really admire him and his an analysis ability. So let's hear what he has to say about the new torture report. This will be about 15 minutes. Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Perez coming to you from Baltimore. Also welcome to the Michael Ratner Report. Michael Ratner is the president of the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York and chair of the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights in Berlin. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael. Always good to be with you, Sharmini, and The Real News. So, Michael, uh, it is a grim torture report to give us the highlights. You know, it's certainly grim. I guess highlights is one word. I guess another word is lowlights because it's it's really brutal reading. And I've been working on this with the Center for Constitutional Rights for years on the torture. We have clients who were tortured, some of them mentioned in this report. Uh, but to read this in black and white and to read how ferociously brutal it was um, and the individual stories is just shocking. I mean, I recommend highly uh, people read that report, uh, read excerpts of it, on, up it, up it online. I mean, some of the most brutal, we've seen some of it before, uh, the waterboarding of people up to, some, in some cases, 183 times. The CIA had claimed that only three people were waterboarded. Uh, but then they have photographs, apparently, the Senate committee who did this report, and that's the Senate Intelligence Committee, found photographs in Afghanistan and other places of buckets of water around waterboards uh, for, obviously, other people. CIA had a process called dousing, which is like waterboarding, very similar. They just don't call it that. And when you read the stories of people waterboarded, hung from the ceiling, and then in one case, while the person's being interrogated, when they knew the person didn't have any information on what they wanted, which was about plots in the United States, they kept going for a week, waterboarding, and then putting the person into coffins. One was called a large coffin for something like 11 days on and off. Another one, the small coffin, 21 inches wide, two and a half feet high, and you're locked into that coffin. I mean, this is hard to believe this report. Another technique, which despite my knowledge and others of the torture regime, was called rectal rehydration or rectal feeding. A word that we could use for that is anal rape. And in one case, Majid Khan was a client of the center. What they did is they would serve his meal tray, which had hummus on it in this case, pasta, and then they would puree it and then according to the report, they would puree it and force it up his anus. Basically, not for medical reasons, but as a form of torture of Majid Khan. I mean, it is shocking. 
Uh, and the questions uh, that I have are many. First of all, let's understand what we have here. We have a report of the executive summary of 500 and some pages from the Senate Intelligence Committee. It's heavily redacted. There was a big struggle to even get this out. Uh, the CIA, and sad to say, the Obama administration insisted on more redactions uh, than the Senate committee wanted. For a while, the Senate committee and Senator Feinstein, who is close to the intelligence agencies, said, we're not putting it out unless you let us put in a more thorough report. Uh, things that are redacted are like crazy. The names of the nine countries where they had secret black sites, where this torture of over 100 people went on. They give them the code names in the report. Something called COBOLT is, for example, one. Well, anybody in this field, like me and others, we know what these places are. They've been revealed. Cobalt is what we refer to as the salt pit in Afghanistan. Heavy torture went on in the salt pit. Uh, they, they take out the names of two of the people, uh, Jens, Jessen and Mitchell, who were the private contractors doing the interrogations. Their company or received something like $80 million. They did 85% of the interrogations. The report just is scathing about their lack of knowledge about what they were doing, the money that went to them. The report doesn't put their names and gives them a pseudonym. Their names have been out there forever. So you got those kind of stupid redactions. But it doesn't take away from the incredible, incredible impact of this re report, uh, a brutality far worse, far worse uh, than any of us knew. Now, let's put it into this context. This is only a report on the CIA interrogation program at the so-called black sites the nine sites we know about from Thailand to Poland uh, to Romania uh, that we know about. But just remember, this doesn't include Guantanamo. It doesn't include Abu Ghraib. It doesn't include other prisons run by the military around the world. It doesn't now, include Michael, does it, does it include the, uh, the contractors that had been hired to do some of this torturing? It doesn't include renditions either. And then as far as contractors, that's what I was saying about Je Jessen and Mitchell, who were two psychologists who ran the program here, private contractors, 85% of the interrogations at these nine black sites, uh, these torture sites, uh, were done by private contractors. A contract of $80 million went to them for these, these private, interrogation, uh, yeah, private interrogations. And so you ask yourself, yes, it's driven by torture, it's driven by our government, but is it also being driven by the fact that so much of this money of our military is going to private contractors who are making billions, billions, uh, ultimately. Uh, so yes, it's private contractors did a lot of this. As I said, the report is explosive on the types of things that were done to people uh, and their stories, uh, including one story of a person who was uh, tried here in New York eventually, Al Nashiri hung from a ceiling for two and a half days, um, two and a half days, hung in a position uh, with a diaper on, not allowed to go to the bathroom, et cetera. A death from hypothermia, a man chained to the floor, et cetera. So we get all of that. Now, one of the big arguments that's being had is, was it effective or was it not effective? Did we get intelligence like that we saw in Zero Dark Thirty to track down Osama bin Laden? As, as all the propaganda says, as the CIA says, as Cheney says, as Bush says, all of these, you know, what you'd only have to call politician pundit torturers uh, are saying. Uh, in fact, according to this report, no intelligence was gotten by the torture. None that would lead to any of these plot, the 20 plots from being stopped, none that really led uh, to Osama bin Laden being found. So the answer is it wasn't effective. But of course, that's not even the question we should be asking. The question that should be asked here is why did they do something that was flatly illegal, for which there's no exceptions? You're simply not allowed to torture. Um, that's the first question. But in addition, as I said, this report finds that it was not effective. And what it makes you wonder is if it wasn't effective and the CIA had to know that, why were they doing it? Uh, according to the report, there were studies before 9-11 that said this kind of interrogation under torture is, isn't, doesn't work. You get false stories. People say anything to stop the torture, et cetera. So they knew it didn't work before. They clearly knew it didn't work during it, and they kept on going. And I remember reading a book uh, called, uh, it was torture from uh, Algeria to Abu Ghraib or something like that about Algeria 
written by an Algerian. And her thesis was the torture that went on in Algeria was not for information. It was because of a declining empire in which it was sort of the macho declining empire just decided. And in our case, the current one, Muslims on the other side, an empire that's been attacked um, at the heart of its financial area in New York City. And in fact, you could have to say that this torture really is about brutalizing and sending a message to the world. You fall into the hands of the United States, you will be tortured. Uh, so that was a conclusion. That's my conclusion. But the conclusion of the report is that nothing, nothing actionable, no justification uh, for what went on. Michael, um, the gruesome details of the report is, you know, today all over the Internet. And I, I guess what's in minds of everyone is, well, you know, what are going to be the consequences for these people who conducted these interrogations in such unlawfulness? Uh, Sharmini, that was exactly the last point I was going to get to, which is I'm glad you asked it. It's about prosecutions. What's going to happen? There's clear crimes were committed, 100 percent. This is not 99 percent. This is 100 percent. We know who did it. Uh, we don't know everything, but we know a lot. And the U.S. has an obligation to prosecute torturers in on its land. It's the Convention Against Torture. They're required to investigate and prosecute. And if they don't do it, any other country where these people travel to has to do it. And the key thing that happened on prosecutions was when Obama took office, he blinked and blinked badly. Remember his statement? He said, we have to look forward and not backward. Forward where we won't torture, but not backwards where we did, or where he almost said we did. He said, in my mind, we tortured. Um, but in any case, he said, look forward, don't look backward. He said, we're not going to have prosecutions. Uh, and in fact, of course, it makes no sense, because if you want to stop torture going forward in the future, you have to teach people a lesson that if you do it, you will be punished. It's not enough to write an executive order saying, let's not torture, um, because the next president or even this one can simply revoke it. And of course, I want to make as an aside here, there is still, we believe, some torture going on, forced feeding at Guantanamo. Um, still sleep deprivation being allowed, isolation, sensory deprivation. Uh, but let's just talk about prosecution. So Obama blinked, and he blinked not because they couldn't get convictions in the end, because they were worried about an American jury. That's what some pundits are putting out now. He blinked because essentially this country and this part of the, our establishment is run by the security establishment, the military and the intelligence. The person who's a CIA director was involved in this uh, back when he was in the uh, Bush administration. He could. That's John Brennan. They wouldn't let him become CIA director the first four years of Obama. Apparently, uh, they did enough washing of him that he is now the CIA director. So Obama is like this uh, with the people who were deeply, deeply involved uh, in what I consider one of the worst, worst excesses uh, of this government and the total denial of obligation uh, against uh, that they had to take regarding torture. Now, let's talk about what Obama said recently. He's made some press statements, as have his press people. First of all, um, he gave a whole thing yesterday about how these people in the CIA are patriots. Uh, they put their lives on the line. He talked about the CIA stars in front of the building for the dead CIA agents who died in, so, in the so-called cause of America, or I would say the cause of imperialism all over the world. Uh, and so he talks about that. Uh, and then he says, in my mind, this was torture. He doesn't say, this was torture. It has to be gone after. Uh, we have to get the. We have to really prosecute the people as is our obligations. Uh, then they ask, ask the uh, today at the press conference uh, of the uh, of his press person. Uh, they ask, well, what do you think about this question of does torture did it work or did it not work? And the press person made an incredible answer. He says, we're going to remain agnostic on that. It's being debated now. But let me just say that debate shouldn't be happening. There should not have been torture. The question of does it work or not work is irrelevant, although this report clearly says it doesn't work. So what do we have now? Uh, we have, first of all, a number of liberals, people I've worked with, uh, not say, saying there shouldn't be prosecutions. It's impossible. We'll never get it. Uh, therefore, uh, let's just go on with this. You know, that's an outrageous position. It's required legally to get prosecutions. We have to all be calling for it. The Center for Constitutional Rights has on its website a petition and call for it, phone numbers, calling for prosecution of the torturers. It has to be done. The United Nations rapporteur, uh, Ben Emerson, the UN said absolutely 
there has to be investigations and prosecutions of the torturers. I think it's a very hard struggle, but when I think about it, I think about Argentina, I think about Chile, I think about the countries that went through their bad, dirty wars of torture, uh, and eventually, today as we speak, 200 trials going on in Argentina for torture and killings that took place over 20 years ago. So I'm not without hope on it. Uh, the United States is difficult, but of course now there's even a bigger call for international prosecutions. I don't mean by that the International Criminal Court, which the U.S. is not a member of. I mean national courts in various states. My office, the center, has brought a prosecution that's still pending in Spain for Guantanamo tortures. We lost the ones in Germany and Switzerland. If there's a time to renew it, um, it's now. And so I feel really strongly uh, this report has actually sent an incredible message. And perhaps, uh, perhaps we will be turning a page on getting prosecutions. Now, is prosecutions the only answer? No, uh, to stopping torture. But is it a necessity? Yes. Uh, because other than that, and this is my last comment, torture becomes a political football, which if you look at the pundits and the stations and the radio and TV and the newspapers now, that's what it is. Cheney and everybody saying, oh, it works, we had to use it. Um, other people are saying it didn't work, the, the Senate committee, and it becomes a political controversy. It's not that. Torture is illegal under all circumstances by anyone anywhere in the world. Michael, uh, one final question to you. Is the Obama administration, if, if the torture uh, convention on the torture requires them to prosecute those who have tortured, um, are they not on the hook to actually uh, bring about some cases against those who are here legally? Well, yes, they are. Legally, the Convention Against Torture is, requires the Obama administration to begin investigations and prosecute. And it recently came up at the UN. In the United Nations, they have what's called a, uh, a convention, a, a committee against torture uh, that, um, that meets to decide whether a country is meeting its obligations under the Convention Against Torture. And the Obama administration just a few weeks ago presented before that committee their claim that they had done what they can, they talked about their investigation, and the committee in its final report just shredded the administration. It said, you have to close Guantanamo. You have to open investigations and prosecute people. You haven't done what you're supposed to do under the Committee Against, for the committee against Torture and under the Torture Convention. So the U.S. is out of its international obligations. And what we have to find outrageous here is that the U.S. tries to insist that other countries comply with international obligations. The U.S. Um, doesn't comply with its own, whether it comes to torture or making wars it did on Iraq. Uh, the U.S. is probably continues to be, uh, as Martin Luther King said, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. Go, oh, thank you. Okay, that was, again, uh, Real News Network, Michael Ratner. And, you know, he didn't pull any punches and he described the horrible things we're doing and I can't believe Darth Cheney will just say that the report was just full of crap. Well, you'll get to see that in a few seconds here. Well, all right. How about the people that uh, were tortured? Do they get to sue now in civil court? Let's uh, listen to Russia Today talk about that subject. The question remains, can these detainees now sue over what was done to them? To discuss all this, I was joined earlier by Todd Pierce, a retired Army Judge Advocate General Officer. I started off by asking him what he thinks about the CIA's claims that contrary to this report, there was actionable intelligence obtained through these interrogations. First, let, uh, you know, the report shows that the CIA has lied consistently since 9-11. Dick Cheney, the administration that was in power at the time, lied consistently. So why would we believe anything they say now that uh, there is actionable intelligence that came out of this? But I do want to correct one thing you said at the beginning of the program. You said there's a left-right divide. I'm a retired military officer, and uh, up until 10 years ago, I would have considered myself a conservative by American political standards. I'm not of the left. Uh, I'll call myself something else now. But what we've seen in, Ameri in the United States, I'll make this very quick, is what we have the right, the GOP, and I had this discussion earlier today, is they're not Nazis. But they're following the example of what was called conservative revolutionaries in 1920s Germany, which was a rival fascist group to the Nazis. And they are equally, as we can see, as militaristic and authoritarian 
as these the 1920s uh, militarists in Germany, and that's a model the GOP has adopted. And it's been fully revealed this last day with all these uh, lies, I would say, in the minority report by the GOP that torture is okay, permissible, uh, et cetera, beginning with Dick Cheney and talking about uh, all this uh, being a bunch of hooey, and he's fully in favor of torture. So again, I think we need to change the paradigm we look at things through. Well, I, I totally agree with you, and changing the paradigm is exactly what we're attempting to do here. To that point, Dick Cheney coming out and saying it's too east, Senate Republicans jumping up and saying, we don't believe any of this. And a lot of the language they're using, Todd, uh, words like, we don't believe that was the case, or we believe that it did lead to intelligence. They're not using terms like there's evidence, or here's evidence, or here's proof. Uh, at what point, especially on the, on the legal side of this, does someone need to show evidence that there was actionable intelligence here? Uh, I don't think, it, where are we talking about bringing this to court? In the United States, in the United States, and actually I'd say internationally for the United States, a, uh, a barrier of impunity has been erected by the United States government over the last many years. So you can't even bring a suit in the United States without getting dismissed because the government would claim there's state secrets involved. And the courts, and as we have seen for 10 years now would immediately dismiss it. So looking to uh, recourse in the United States courts, I think is uh, you know not going to happen. Uh, internationally, you know we've de we've refused to uh, go into the ICC because we wanted to ensure that we would never be held accountable for international war crimes, and that's exactly what would happen today. Uh, there's there's no forum outside anywhere that can try us. So what we have to be done, but we have to remember though, there's no statute of limitation for war crimes. And so it may take a long time, but both Americans, and let me say as an American, we sh I'm ashamed, and as for all Americans, we should be outraged and ashamed for what some sex pervert. Okay, uh, I cut out of that a little bit early. I wanna make sure that I get the, the we're, there's gonna be one more video at the end, but right now we're gonna go in and see uh, what Cheney has to say about the torture report. Maybe you heard some of it, but this it's just amazing. How can somebody be so cold? How can somebody be so effervescently evil? I, I don't know how to put it. He just eats. Ah. Okay, play it. <laughs> Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. On Wednesday this week, Senator Mark Udall, Senator from Colorado, who is a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, accused current CIA Director John Brennan of being openly hostile towards their investigation in producing the torture report and called on him to resign. Further, he accused the CIA of lying. Let's have a look. Director Brennan and the CIA today are continuing to willfully provide inaccurate information and misrepresent the efficacy of torture. In other words, the CIA is lying. This is not a problem of the past, Madam President, but a problem that needs to be dealt with today. On Thursday this week, Brennan had a press conference of his own where he was asked the same question that you'd all raised by an NPR reporter, Tom Bauman. Let's have a look at that. Uh, thanks for doing this, Tom Bauman with NPR. I wonder if you could clarify something. You say here that we have not concluded that there was use of EITs within the program that allowed us to obtain useful information from detainees subjected to them. And then you say in the following page, the committee's view that detainees subjected to EITs did not produce useful intelligence, a point on which we disagree. So which is it? Did the EITs lead to useful intelligence, or did they not? Or do you just, you said it's unknowable. Which is it? <clears throat> what I said was that detainees who were subjected to EITs at some point during their confinement subsequently provided information that our experts found to be useful and valuable in our counterterrorism efforts. And the cause and effect relationship between the application of those EITs and the ultimate provision of the information is unknown and unknowable. But for someone to say that there was no intelligence of value, of use, that came from those detainees once they were subjected to EITs, I think that is, lacks any foundation at all. 
Now joining us from Washington, D.C. to discuss all of this is Jonathan S. Lande. He has several Pulitzer Prize nominations, and he is a national security and intelligence correspondent for McClatchy Newspapers based in Washington, D.C. Jonathan, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Jonathan, so what is your reaction to what Senator Udall charges and the response of John Brennan, the director of the CIA? Well, I, you know, it's very hard to say, given the fact that I don't have clearances and I'm not privy to the information, the documents on which the Senate committee's report was based. I can only tell you that the Senate committee says that uh, this program failed to elicit uh, any meaningful intelligence vis-a-vis -vis, uh, tracking down senior terrorist leaders like Osama bin Laden uh, or providing intelligence on uh, imminent plots. That's something that CIA Director John Brennan disputes. He contends that uh, the program, the, the so-called RDI program, Rendition, Detention and Interrogation Program, uh, did produce very valuable intelligence that helped track down terrorist leaders, including bin Laden, that uh, helped uh, uh, disclose and uh, block plots that were being uh, prepared by al-Qaeda, and that the agency continues to use today uh, to understand the internal workings of al-Qaeda. Um, one of the more interesting things, though, that came out of Brennan's news conference was a statement that I'm going to have to paraphrase here, uh, where he said that uh, he wanted to make clear that the agency's own reviews had not come to a judgment that the techniques themselves specifically uh, were responsible for eliciting this information from the detainees who were held for some in cases for several years in so-called black site prisons overseas, but that the program itself, the interrogation of, uh, of, these, of detainees not necessarily using these particular techniques did in fact produce uh, valuable intelligence. And that's a, a bit of a retreat from what has been a consistent assertion by both the CIA, uh, former Bush administration officials and former CIA officials that these techniques, which a lot of people refer to as torture, specifically elicited this information. So Brennan seems to be backing away from that particular aspect of this. Jonathan, uh, the nation, people in, involved in this, the CIA and, and the committee all seem to be preoccupied with whether these techniques worked uh, to obtain useful information. But isn't the real question here the violation of the International Convention on Torture? Well, you know, I think a lot of people believe that that is the bottom line and not just the International Convention on Torture. The United States adopted its own laws to be in compliance with that convention, which on which it was a major architect. Uh, but there are also United States laws uh, that would pertain to the mistreatment of detainees. Uh, and uh, that is the question. But that's not a question that I don't think is going to get resolved by any of this because the committee itself avoided concluding that any laws had been broken or the international uh, uh, treaties had been broken, even though the chairwoman of the committee, Diane Feinstein, the uh, senator from California, s wrote in the forward of the, c of the uh, report that she believes that laws were broken by CIA personnel and treaties were broken by CIA personnel. The Obama administration... Okay, we exited out of that one. Um yeah, I, Brenner, Cheney, I get them all mixed up, but they're they're from the same evil core, I think. Yeah, we saw Cheney earlier on Abby Martin on the first cut uh, about torture. So anyway, we're going to go right into what I thought was probably one of the more important videos that we're showing today. This gets down to some root causes, the financial situation, about jobs, about exporting the economy, because you can make a buck somewhere else you know do we this gets back to the question what do you want what type of society do you want to live in do you want to live in one where just a few people are allowed to be slopping at the trough greedy at the expense of everybody else 
Oh, or are you tired of living the way we are? Okay, well, we're going to talk about the effect of capitalism. Let's check this one out. This, is, this will go to the end of the show. I'll, I might be back to say goodbye, but if not, I'll see you next week. Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux in Baltimore. The International Labor Organization just released their Global Wages Report. Now joining us to discuss that report is Richard Wolf. Richard is the Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he taught economics for 35 years. And he's currently a visiting professor of the Graduate Program in International Affairs at the New School University in New York. Thanks so much for joining us, Rick. Thank you very much for inviting me. So, Rick, what really stood out to you in this report? What stood out for me in this ILO report are, first, the comparison of what has happened to wages. And the comparison is between the advanced economies, Western Europe, North America, and Japan, on the one hand, and the so-called emerging, major emerging economies. And there they really mean China, but also India, Brazil, and a few other countries like that. And here's the stunning result. Looking over the last decade that we're talking about, eight to 10 years, wages have been rising much, much faster in the emerging economies than in the old established capitalist economies of Western Europe, North America, and Japan. And they're not even close. Wage increases are in the three, four, five, six percent a year range in China, for example, and they're in the one to two percent range in North America and Western Europe and Japan. In other words, the capitalists' decisions made over the last 30 years to move production out of North America, out of Western Europe, out of Japan, and into China, India, Brazil, and so on, has meant that wages stagnated in the old industrial centers like the United States, and they are going up very quickly in China. It's a cautionary tale for people who want to be critical of the position of workers in China. You want to understand China, and you want to understand the United States, the ILO report makes it clear that wages are rising where capitalists have gone and they're not going anywhere in the places that capitalists have abandoned. And the United States is in the latter category. Let's talk about why capitalists have abandoned the United States, um, Rick, because some people are going to say, you know, they abandoned it because unions got too strong. They were demanding too much. People just can't afford to pay people those kind of wages and have those kind of pensions. What do you say to that kind of argument? Uh, I say that you must be living in a different planet from me. Let me give you an, a, a simple example. The number of people in the private sector, and that's what we mean when we talk about capitalists making a decision, not a government job, a private sector job where your employer is a capitalist making a profit. In the capitalist private sector of the United States, less than 7% of workers are represented by a trade union. That's right, 6.9% of, of private sector employees are in a union. To talk about unions being strong with that number is a hallucination. To imagine that unions are shaping the level of wages in our country by their strength is another hallucination. This has nothing to do with our situation. And indeed, over the last 30 years, wages in the United States have not gone up. They've been stagnating. That's in part what the ILO report indicates. So if capitalists are leaving, it's not because wages are rising here. The reason capitalists are leaving is because wages are very low in those parts of the world that used to be poor colonial backwaters of the West. Those countries have now stood up, they're developing, they're independent, and they want jobs for their people, and they know they have a powerful weapon namely the historically low wages. So a company leaves California or Cincinnati or Pittsburgh or Detroit and moves to Shanghai or Hyderabad or somewhere else, particularly in Asia, to take advantage of the fact that they can pay people there one third, one quarter or less 
of what they would have to pay an equivalent worker here in the United States. The cup companies therefore make much more profits. And as any honest member of the business community will tell you, they're in the business to make profits. And they left the United States because they could make more money over there. But we as Americans have to then face something. For decades, we have been giving these companies all kinds of benefits, tax holidays, subsidies, government support programs, government orders for whatever it is they produce. And states have done the same, and cities have done the same. But those companies took all those benefits, built themselves up, and have now decided, hasta la vista, baby, I'm leaving. I'm going someplace else where I can st take still more money. And I'm going to leave behind an empty factory, uh, a parking lot with weeds growing out of it, decimated families who've lost jobs, decimated communities who have no more revenue coming in to the city or the state government because the jobs aren't there, because the companies left town. This is a catastrophe for the people left behind. And one of the ways it shows up in the United States, documented by this ILO report, is the stagnant wages, the wages that in North America, Western Europe, and Japan just aren't going up hardly at all, while they go up very sharply in those areas to which the capitalists went to take advantage of their lower wages. Rick, if I'm one of those people that was left behind, as you described, what do you do about it? Because it sounds pretty grim. Uh, can you even compete with, with other workers? Should you be competing with them? What, what do you do? Well, you know, it's, the solution is actually quite easy. When a capitalist leaves, it's because he can make more profit by moving to China. Suppose you said to the businessman or woman, uh, we're going to close that option. You can't do that. Well, then the in ingenuity and the creativity of that business person will have to be redirected someplace else. There's an example from child labor that can make this point. Once upon a time in American history, we allowed as a nation children to be employed as young as four and five years of age. Capitalists in large numbers, particularly in the garment industry, but in other industries too, hired children. They paid them much less than they paid adults, and so they found great profits in getting work done by underpaid or low-paid children. Reformers came back and said, my God, this is inhumane. Those children should be in school. It's not healthy, not physically, not mentally, uh, for them to be in sweatshops and factories and all the rest of it. And the capitalists said, my God, that's going to damage our profits. And if you damage our profits, we won't be able to help this economy grow. And the reformers said, well, we're sorry. You're going to have to find it another way to grow. And laws were passed that made child labor illegal. And we didn't do it anymore. And we haven't done it for a long, long time. Guess what? Did capitalism collapse? Hardly. Did businesses fall apart? Not at all. What you did was you made businesses find other ways to improve their profits, new technologies, new customers, new raw materials, new commodities to produce. There are lots of ways for businesses to make money. And when you cut off something that society doesn't want, it's not the end of the world. Well, here's my example. Cut off the ability to abandon a city like Detroit or Cleveland or Camden, New Jersey, or thousands of other American cities suffering from this problem. Say to the businesses, you can't take all that we've given you over the years in subsidies and tax breaks and special courses in the high schools to get kids ready to work in your business. You can't walk away from that to go get profit someplace else, leaving a social disaster behind. That's as unacceptable to us as child labor was years ago. And you close the door on factories leaving and you say to the businesses, you're just going to have to find less socially destructive ways to improve your business. They overcame the problem with no longer being able to hire children. And guess what? They can also find ways to improve their business situation without laying waste to city after city in this country uh, and, and the social consequences of that are just beginning 
to percolate into our consciousness in places like Ferguson, Missouri, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, the poorer sections of New York, et cetera, et cetera. Rick, but I can just hear people like on the business side saying, but I own this company. How can you tell me what to do with something that I own? Same story as with the child labor. It's my business. I want to be able to hire who I want. Answer of the society. Very nice, sir. It is your business. But you can't do that because it is socially unacceptable behavior. Let me give you another example that's more modern. There was a time when an employer felt, particularly they were males, that they had all kinds of sexual rights with their female employees. And they didn't hesitate in many examples. And we know of cases right now, don't we, where employers or people in power take advantage of their employer situation to extract sexual favors from their subordinates. And we have made as a society the the decision that's illegal. And the answer, it's my business, I can do what I want, and if an employee doesn't want to do what I want, they can jolly well leave. This answer of the business community has been laughed out of the courtroom. They can't do it. Now, I would argue as an economist that the damage done to our society from child labor and from sexually unwanted demands from employers are no better or worse than the damage done by having companies leave the United States, leaving behind decimated communities. This is an unacceptable social cost of capitalists' freedom. And in those situations, you curtail the freedom of the capitalist for the greater freedom of the larger community not to be stuck with the costs of a capitalism that works this way. I think we're better off for having stopped child labor. I think we're better off for having made it illegal for an employer to impose sexual uh, demands on subordinates. And I think we'll be much better off if we stop permitting capitalists to get up and leave to make more money, leaving the waste and the destruction behind. And I would add one more little historical piece of information. The country in the world that has perhaps gone the furthest in imposing limits and conditions and prohibitions on private capitalists leaving their country is the country called Germany. And in the last six years of this crisis, Germany has done better than every other capitalist country, certainly way better than the United States. So the notion that you can't constrict your capitalists and make it difficult or impossible for them to leave, which the Germans do, that this will somehow harm your capitalist system, Germany is an example that the opposite is more likely the case. All right, Rick Wolf, always a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, and I'll see you guys next week. Have a good uh, week. (laughs) Bye.